Cape Otway Light Station is the oldest surviving and most important lighthouse in mainland Australia. Built in 1848, the lighthouse perches on towering sea cliffs 90 metres above the shipwreck coast, where Bass Strait and the Southern Ocean collide. This is one of the most treacherous stretches of coastline anywhere in the world. Littered with the wrecks of hundreds of ships, many lives were lost in these shipwrecks off Cape Otway, a sad but fascinating history that led to the building of the light station. But there's more than just a lighthouse here at Cape Otway. Hidden away behind the lighthouse is a World War II secret bunker so secret that there are only three photographs of it from the war. When it was built in 1942, it played a significant role in Australian and American war history. There's an amazing story to be told here. Don't miss it. The drama, beauty and wilderness of this part of Victoria's coastline is breathtaking. Here the land doesn't gently slope down to meet the sea. Rather, the sea repeatedly attacks the cliffs, carving chunks of rock away until the land is left a solitary pillar of rock. Eventually, the pillar gives in to the repeated pummeling of the waves and crumbles to join the reefs below. Reefs that seethe with foam and salt spray in storms and give this area its other name, the Shipwreck Coast. At the heart of the fabled Shipwreck Coast, which has claimed more ships than any other stretch of coastline in this country, stands Australia's most significant lighthouse, Cape Otway. From the observation deck at the top of the lighthouse, there are breathtaking views of the dramatic coast and waters where you get the feel for the weather of the Roaring Forties. Those strong westerly winds in the Southern Hemisphere found between 40 to 50 degrees latitude that were a major aid to ships sailing from Europe to Australia, which made this lighthouse essential for the safety of these ships and their passengers. But it wasn't just the winds, waves and rocks that were a threat to ships here. There were more sinister dangers. A year before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor changed the course of World War II, Adolf Hitler's forces claimed one of the first American war casualties. Here in the waters off Cape Otway, the Germans sank the first American vessel in World War II. The American ship SS City of Ravel steamed into Bass Strait after departing Port Piri, South Australia, with a cargo of lead bound for New York. It hit a German landmine early on the evening of the 8th of November, 1940. World War II had exploded into Australian waters. Few people realise the Germans came down this far south or that they successfully sank three ships in Bass Strait. They pirated a Norwegian merchant trading vessel called the Storstad off Australia's northwest coast and converted it into a mine layer and renamed it the Passat. They used it to lay about 40 mines in the waters off Cape Otway. One of them was washed up on the rocks and gives us an idea as to the size of these mines. The city of Ravel sank quickly after hitting one of the mines. The lighthouse keeper saw and heard the explosion and raised the alarm. Three rescue boats were dispatched from Apollo Bay and rushed to the ship's aid. 37 crew members were saved, but one returned to the ship 
and was drowned, becoming the first US Merchant Navy casualty of World War II. Australians suddenly had a real sense of being at war with Nazi Germany. The war was no longer a remote event in Europe. The enemy was now on our very shores. The sinking of the city of Ravel was followed in 1942 by the launch of an observation aircraft from a Japanese submarine just off Cape Otway. The aircraft flew over the lighthouse and on to Melbourne to take photos before returning to the submarine. Both the submarine and the German mines were kept secret to avoid panic and maintain morale and ensure the public weren't frightened that the Germans and Japanese were this far south. But these incidents galvanised the authorities into action and they built four radar bunkers along the coastline, including this one at Cape Otway. Built under a veil of secrecy, these bunkers were built for one reason, the detection and interception of the enemy. Up to 50 servicemen were stationed here to keep a lookout for Japanese and German submarines. The data they collected was sent by wireless telegraphy to the top secret defence headquarters in Melbourne. The information was then plotted on the main operations board so aircraft could be dispatched to investigate or engage unidentified or hostile aircraft, ships or submarines. The Cape Otway radar bunker was one of the best kept secrets of the war. But as fascinating as this World War II intrigue and bunker are, the Cape Otway Lighthouse provides an intriguing window into much more of Australia's past. It's the oldest surviving lighthouse on mainland Australia, with the light in continuous operation since 1848. Before Bass Strait was discovered by Matthew Flinders around 1799, ships had to sail around Tasmania, Van Diemen's Land back then, taking an extra week to 10 days. Then Lieutenant James Grant discovered a shortcut through Bass Strait. This new route shaved off nearly 1,200 kilometres or up to a week from the journey and quickly became the popular approach to the colony of Port Jackson later Sydney from the early 1800s. There was only one problem with the new route, the narrow gap between Cape Otway and King Island at the mouth of Bass Strait. It's only 90 kilometres wide, but became an infamous graveyard for many a sailing ship. It caught out even the most experienced mariners who likened this perilous stretch of water to threading the eye of the needle. In the Bass Strait, the mighty Southern Ocean is forced through a passage nearly 90 kilometres wide and up onto the continental shelf, where the sea bottom becomes relatively shallow. In these parts, the wind blows and swells of 10 to 20 metres aren't rare. On a typical day, the swell is about six metres. Imagine after three long, dreary months of traversing the wide ocean, sailing ships face the delicate navigational task of threading the eye of the needle. There was nothing to guide and direct the ship through what was considered the most dangerous stretch of water in the world. One mistake could have the ship tragically wrecked on the rocks and reefs of the shipwreck coast. And sadly, there were many mistakes. After a series of tragic shipwrecks off the coast here that claimed hundreds of lives, a lighthouse was eventually commissioned. In 1835, almost 250 lives were lost and there were very few survivors when the Neva floundered off King Island while trying to enter Bass Strait. 135 female convicts their 55 children, 
30 male convicts and all the crew perished. Rose Ann Highland was one of only a handful of survivors of the Neva tragedy. Three of her children perished. Rose showed great courage in giving testimony to a government inquiry into the need for a lighthouse at the entrance to Bass Strait. She gave a dramatic account of the night the Neva was wrecked, as well as some insight into the perilous conditions faced by single women on the long journey to the new colonies, both at the hands of the elements and at the hands of the sometimes unscrupulous sailors. But it took another major shipping disaster almost 10 years later before action was taken to overcome the deadly entrance to Bass Strait. The entire nation of Australia was left reeling after the Katarakai was wrecked on the west coast of King Island on August 3, 1845, claiming the lives of over 400 people. It remains to this day Australia's worst peacetime maritime disaster. These shipping tragedies were of great concern to Charles Latrobe, the superintendent of Port Phillip, now Melbourne. News of these shipwreck tragedies and the great loss of life spread to London, and immigrants became reluctant to board Australian-bound ships. They preferred safer passages to the colonies of America, Canada and Africa. This was a disaster for La Trobe because it hindered the young colony's efforts to attract immigrant families and labour. He presented a summation and a powerful final argument to the Select Committee of Lighthouses, established to determine the location of a lighthouse at the entrance to Bass Strait. La Trobe's passionate plea and the public outrage and widespread condemnation following these tragic shipwrecks forced the New South Wales government to finally commission a lighthouse at the entrance to Bass Strait. Its task was to warn ships of danger and guide them safely on their way and so prevent any further loss of life. Charles Latrobe, who considered himself an amateur explorer, made three overland attempts at reaching Cape Otway before finding success in 1846, thanks to the help of Aborigines and settlers. It had taken him a whole year, but he finally marked the proposed site for a lighthouse at the most southerly point in the region. To endure the storms and harsh conditions, the lighthouse had to be built on a rock-solid foundation. It had to be steadfast, sturdy and reliable. The construction of the lighthouse was an amazing feat. Stone used to build the lighthouse was sourced and cut at Park River, five kilometres away, and transported by oxen. Seventy men worked for 10 months to shape the sandstone to such perfect and exacting proportions, no cement was required to assemble the tower. It's 21 metres high and stands 91 metres above sea level. The lamp was finally lit on the 29th of August, 1848. It was manufactured in London and was brought ashore at Cape Otway through crashing surf in small boats. The light mechanism consisted of 21 polished reflectors and lamps mounted on a frame. Originally, it was fueled by whale oil, then kerosene, and later, electricity. The light shone nearly 50 kilometres out to sea and gave a really bright light. Its brightness is equivalent to one million candles. Cape Otway Lighthouse had a scandalous start. The first lighthouse keeper, Captain James Lawrence, was a drunken rogue who failed to keep the light shining. He was dismissed only months into his posting. Subsequent lighthouse keepers were charged with maintaining the light, shining a beacon of hope onto Bass Strait to prevent any further loss of life. The light must be kept shining. 
But life wasn't easy for lighthouse keepers and their families. Cape Otway was a wild and isolated place. It was a lonely and difficult existence. Working conditions were challenging and the pay was low. They also struggled with limited food provisions and infrequent deliveries. The situation was especially difficult for the second light keeper at Cape Otway, Henry Bayless Ford and his wife Mary. This is also true of Catherine Evans, the wife of long-serving assistant keeper William Evans, who lost two young children at the Cape, a son Cornelius in 1867 and an 11-month-old daughter Catherine in 1868. There's a headstone at the graves of the children at the nearby Cape Otway Cemetery. William Evans served longer than any other assistant keeper at Cape Otway for well over 20 years. About 30 ships were wrecked off the coast just out from Cape Otway, from the lighthouse. Two of the most significant of these ships were Jenny and Eric the Red. Jenny was sunk in 1854. Now, just a few years after this lighthouse was completed in 1848, gold was discovered in Ballarat. And uh, workers throughout Australia went AWOL as they searched for their fortune at Ballarat. They left their jobs, and even some of the assistant lighthouse keepers here at Cape Otway left their position, left their post, and made their way to Ballarat. Now, it was during this time that the head lighthouse keeper had taken full responsibility for keeping the lamp burning. And during this time, one morning while walking on the nearby beach, he found a large section of fresh mast and he knew that a ship had sunk. He then went searching and sure enough, at a beach not far from here, he discovered the survivors of the Jenny. He brought them back here to the lighthouse station at Cape Otway and cared for them using his own supplies until help was provided. In 1851, Victoria had a population of 77,000 people. By 1861, just 10 years later, the population of Victoria was 540,000 people, which was half the total population of Australia. Most of them arrived by sea, with ships carrying people and ships carrying the supplies they ordered in from overseas, and ships carrying the gold they dug up and sent back to England. Each of these ships faced the same treacherous conditions along the shipwreck coast. Each of the passengers and crew knew all about the tragic shipwrecks, but they had no other option for travel, so continued their journey, placing their faith in the captain and hoping that the weather would be mild and they would make it through the dangerous waters safely. When the weather was rough, every person on board would strain their eyes to see the light shining from the Cape Otway Lighthouse along the shipwreck coast. The long-awaited sighting of the Cape Otway Lighthouse brought great relief to ship's captains as they attempted the dangerous manoeuvre of threading the eye of the needle and entering Bass Strait. You can imagine what it was like for newcomers to this land. For many thousands of early migrants, Cape Otway was their first sight of land after leaving Europe or North America and many months at sea. They'd sailed more than 20,000 kilometres and had spent more than three, four or five months at sea. It was the longest journey an immigrant could take. As an immigrant, you couldn't take a longer journey anywhere in the world. They'd just experienced the storms and trials of this long and arduous journey without seeing land. And then they saw the lighthouse. This was their first landfall, their first sight of land in a long time. When they saw the lighthouse, 
They knew they had safe passage into Bass Strait. They knew they could negotiate the eye of the needle. They were safe. The lighthouse would guide them to their new home. So to many passengers and crew, the Cape Otway Lighthouse became known as the Beacon of Hope. Today, Cape Otway Lighthouse stands here as a reminder of the storms and challenges experienced by sailors and migrants coming to Australia. It's also a reminder that we all experience storms and challenges in our lives. Maybe you're currently in the midst of a raging storm, maybe multiple storms. You may even think they're going to totally overwhelm you. Storms are a certainty, but you don't have to fight life's huge storms alone. God is always ready to be your lighthouse in the storms of life. He has the power to either calm the storm or carry you through it. He is like the lighthouse, your beacon of hope, your place of refuge from the enormous storms that try to engulf and destroy you. Listen to Psalm 107, verses 28 to 30. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and He brings them out of their distress. He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So He guides them to their desired haven. God has the real power to keep you safe. You don't have to fight the storms by yourself any longer. He promises to protect you and guide you to safety. He will lead you to a place of refuge, a place of shelter to endure the storm. Notice this encouraging promise in Psalm chapter 91, verses 1 to 3. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver you. Isn't that reassuring? God promises to protect you and deliver you, but there's more. Listen as God's promise continues in Psalm 91, verses 14 and 15. I will deliver him, I will set him on high. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honour him. Perhaps our program today has touched your heart and impressed you with a desire to learn more about Jesus Christ and how He can be your lighthouse, your protector and provider. Would you like to learn more about the most popular man in history? We've got a wonderful resource that can help you discover so much about the light of Jesus Christ. It's called Finding Treasure, A Beginner's Guide. This easy to read booklet can be yours and is absolutely free. There's no cost and no obligation whatsoever. So don't miss this wonderful opportunity. Here's the information you need. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand. Or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. That's right, you can have today's offer completely free of charge and with absolutely no obligation. So don't delay. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website or simply scan the QR code on your screen to request today's free offer, totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or PO Box 76673, 
Manukau, Auckland 2241 New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you would like God to be your personal lighthouse and to provide you with peace, guidance and safety, then why not ask Him right now as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you will illuminate our path and guide us on our journey through life. Thank you for being our lighthouse, our beacon of hope during the storms of life. We are grateful that we don't have to fight these storms alone. May we always remember that you are with us, that we are never alone in the midst of these storms. I pray that you will send each one of us your peace today, the peace that passes all understanding. And thank you that during all of life's storms, you provide a perfect place of safety and refuge for us. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. If you've enjoyed today's journey, be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together and experience another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. The incredible journey truly is television that changes lives. Until next week, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. <laughs>